Like probably all of you, I've seen the amazing data moshing setup fellow YouTuber cham to go built in Unreal Engine some weeks ago. And I couldn't help wondering if I could pull off the same effect in Houdini using Copernicus. And as it turns out, it's actually quite easy and fun. So that's what we're going to do in this episode. So again, first of all, all credit for the main idea of the setup goes to this guy, goes to jam 2 go who made this amazing, amazing video about building a data moshing effect in Unreal Engine. Link is in the description. But now let's talk about how we're doing this in Houdini and let's first of all talk about data moshing and what this actually is. So usually as 3D artists, we tend to think of a video file as an image sequence. However, for some video files, that is not true especially for video files that are very compressed. Only a few of those frames inside of that video are actual images that we can take a look at. And we call those iframes. The vast majority of frames inside such a video file are so-called p-frames. And those do not store images. What they store instead are movements of single pixel groups throughout the image or throughout the video. And the reason we're doing this is those p-frames usually need to store a lot less details than the equivalent iframe, which makes them far easier to compress. And this in the end leads to a smaller video file. So what we're doing in data moshing, at least in the traditional sense, is we're going to take one of those compressed video files and we're simply going to start removing iframes. And now those p-frames simply have to push around and mosh around the last iframe, this one right here, a lot more, a lot further. And this in the end leads to all those nice and glitchy artifacts that we're after here. But again, this is the traditional approach. And both in Unreal and Houdini, we don't have iframes and p-frames. So what are we going to do here? And this is where the idea from champ to go comes in. So while we do not have iframes and p-frames, what we do have is something called a beauty pass and something called a motion vector pass. And for the youngsters in the audience, motion vector passes are a somewhat old school way of doing motion blur, not while rendering, but while compositing. And pretty much any render engine can output a motion vector pass. And again, all this is is something that stores movement. This is something very similar to an actual p-frame in a compressed video. So what we can do to recreate this effect is we can simply get rid of a lot of our actual beauty passes and simply take one single frame of a beauty pass and over the next frames use our motion vector passes to distort that beauty pass further and further and further. And what we're going to get out in the end, again, really, really looks like something that we get by traditional data moshing. And also, since we're not relying on ancient video codecs to do this data moshing effect, we have some more perks. We have a lot more timing control because we can set those iframes, those quote unquote iframes wherever we want. We can also stay in ACES 32-bit linear color throughout our entire process, give us a lot more options later in color grading. And also, of course, since we're in Copernicus, we can use masks and filters and noises and all this other stuff to really tweak the effect, really make this thing interesting. But now let's jump into Houdini and let's actually build this. I first of all want to talk about render settings. Again, this is something that every render engine, every program should be able to do. However, building this in Karma and Solaris has some quirks, so I will quickly go over them. So what you're going to do in Karma is first of all, build your setup as usual. And then once you're done there, you're going to drop down, first of all, a cache node. And on this cache node, you're going to set the cache behavior to always cache all frames. And this is mandatory within Solaris to get accurate motion vector passes. Also, again, since I think this effect gets a lot cooler when we start using masks, I want to set up some masks as well. And you can do this within Karma very quickly by dropping down a Karma Cryptomat node. And in here, checking either crypto primitives or crypto materials. And finally, in the render settings, under image output, we want to head over to AOVs. Under utility, we should have one pass called motion vectors and we want to enable this. And our CryptoMet pass should already be enabled just by using this node in here. Also, if you want to do denoising, this absolutely works, so you can turn this on. But also, if you are going to use a CryptoMet pass, you have to use something that's not lossy compression. So in this case, I'm using a SIP single scan line. Usually, when exporting EXRs, I would choose DWAB because this is a lot smaller. However, in this case, I have to stick to zip. You can find this setup right here in your scene file downloads and you can simply use this to export your rendered frames and keep going with the setup. 
Now to actually build the setup, I'm going to jump into an empty scene file. And again, I want to build this in the OBJ context because I want to make use of a sub solver. So first of all, let's drop down a geo node. Let's dive inside. And in here, I want to drop down a cop network. And this cop network in here is just there to load in, first of all, our different frames, to display our different frames. And later, again, we're going to build the rest inside a sub solver. But for now, let's jump inside this cop network and let's load in the image sequence that we rendered out. So I'm going to drop down a file node and in my render folder, I'm going to grab this sequence right here, which goes from frame 72 to frame 144. Let's hit accept here. Again, we need to set up our timeline. So this goes from frame 72 to frame 144, like this. Now we have a start and an end frame, like this. And also to make this display correctly, I want to simply right click the display options right here, enable color correction, and set the tone mapping to ACES. This is what I use for rendering. And again, this is all we're going to do in this copnet. This is just there to load our files. So let's jump back out. This copnet is also outputting a Houdini volume that is our picture like this. And let's now drop down a sub solver and let's keep working in here. So on the sub solver, I first of all want to set up the start frame, the frame where I want to start actually moshing my data. And in this case, I'm going to set the starting frame to a value of 96. And I also want to use this frame to later switch between our main stream right here and our solver stream, our data moshing stream right here. So I'm going to drop down a switch node in here. I'm going to wire in my copnet into my solver, the solver into my switch node, and then the copnet also into my switch node as a second input. And on my solver, I'm going to right click my start frame, say copy parameter, and in my switch, I want to check if $f, so our current frame, is smaller than a relative reference like this. So until frame 96, this is just using this input from a copnet right here. And after frame 96, it's actually using a solver. One additional thing that I want to do, since EXRs inside Copernicus are somewhat slow, and I want to have a quick playback, the solver already has a caching mode. However, this GeoStream right here hasn't. So I'm simply going to drop down a cache node on this GeoStream as well to all make this playback really fast. Now we're done with this part of the setup and we can finally jump into our sub solver. First of all, again, I want to make use of my starting frame and I want to switch between this GeoStream and this GeoStream, so a previous frame or input one based on a starting frame. So again, another switch node. Let's wire in the previous frame first and then our input one in here. And we simply want to check if our $f is equal to, again, the relative reference to our starting frame. So something like this. And finally, in here, I'm going to drop down a null. This will be a reference to my copnet that I'm going to drop down in second. I'm going to call this in. And finally, we're going to drop down our main copnet and wire this into the output like this. Let's highlight our copnet, let's jump inside. And let's first of all bring in this frame. For this, I'm going to use a sub import node. I'm going to check use external sub. And I'm going to jump out of this node, out of the next node, and I'm going to select my in null right here. To turn this into a corpse layer, I'm going to use a geo to layer node. And I have to match the right signature, so let's turn this to RGBA like this. And now we actually have a corpse image that we can work with. So this is our beauty pass. Now we have to load up our motion vector pass. For this, again, I'm going to use a file node and again, I'm going to load in the image sequence that I rendered out. And to get all my AOVs from this file node, I'm going to hit the add AOVs from file button down here. So in the end, we should have, again, our beauty pass, which we won't use in this case. However, also motion vectors and our crypto objects. Let's not worry about the crypto objects for now. What we're instead going to do is we're simply going to grab our motion vector pass and we're going to use this to distort our main beauty pass. So all we need to build this is a distort node like this. This takes in first of all the source and then also a direction and this will be my motion vectors. However, right now this is an RGB value. This is only once a two-dimensional value and the somewhat strangely named node inside COPS that does this for us is an RGB to UV node. Again, this does not convert our RGB values in here to UV coordinates. This is just turning a 3D vector into a 2D vector. So we're going to wire in our motion vectors in here and the UV into the direction like this. And finally, we're going to end this with a null. 
And we're going to wire in the output of our distort node in. Now we should already see some distortion happening. And if we go to our distort node and go to the parameters and play with the distortion scale, we should also be able to see something that really already starts looking like data moshing, which is exactly what we want. Now we have to dial in this value that we're going to add in here. This is something that depends both on the resolution and then also the speed of your animation. And in the end, I think it's best to just eyeball this value. And in this case, for the setup that we're building in here, I found a value of 0 0.01 to work nicely for this resolution and the speed. And this should be pretty much all we need to do for our base setup. So let's quickly try this out. Let's jump back out. Let's highlight our switch down here and let's quickly play through our animation. Again, this will first of all play somewhat slowly because EXRs are slow within Copernicus. However, once we've run through our timeline once, we should see some nice outputs. And after a bit of waiting, we have this really nice data most result. So this is our basic setup done. Now we can refine it and really have some fun here. So let's jump back into our solver, back into our copnet. Let's make sure we're on frame 96. Our copnet does actually have some data to work with. And let's keep adding stuff to this. The first thing that I want to do in here is right now, I think the data moshing streaks are looking a bit too clean. We're missing some of these compression artifacts that we're going to see with those really old, really compressed video formats. So to sort of emulate this, I just want to add a little bit of noise to my distortion vectors, to my motion vectors. So to do this, I'm first of all going to start with a fractal noise. I'm going to pipe in my motion vectors as a size reference. And to get sort of blocky artifacts, I'm going to set the noise type to wall a cellular F2 minus F1. And I'm going to set the metric to Manhattan. And this sort of gets us some blocky shapes that we can work with. Right now, this is just mono noise. However, we want slope directions, so. I'm going to search for the slope direction cop node. I'm going to wire this in here. And now we have something that looks quite similar here to a motion vector pass. And the last thing that I want to do in here is simply blend this with our motion vectors. So let's drop down a blend node. Our motion vectors goes into the background and our noise into the foreground. And I want just a small amount of noise in here. So let's set this to a value of 0 0.05. Just have a tiny bit of noise in here in our motion vectors. And this is what I want to pipe in the end into the direction input. So this is the first thing that I want to do in here. The next thing that I want to do is I actually want to restrict the area that I want to mosh either to just my alien egg object right here in the middle or everything else. And for this, again, I want to make use of those crypto mats. No, COPS or Copernicus is still in beta and crypto mats in Copernicus are very in beta which makes them somewhat hard to use. There's one node that we can use to get to our CryptoMet, and this is the CryptoMet node. And on this CryptoMet node, we can simply wire in our first Crypto AOV in here. And now this is where it gets somewhat tedious to use because we don't actually have a picker in here yet, a picker where we can pick out the right crypto object. In this case, we just have to remember the right path that we set within Solaris for our object. And in this case, I'm just going to add this in. I'm just going to paste this in. And I want to select the background, which hides under slash grid slash mesh underscore zero like this. And this is now a mask for a background. Again, this is quite tedious. I th also think that Rohan Darby made a video about how to make CryptoMats work in Copernicus and make this a bit easier for you. I'm also going to link this in the description. However, in this case, I want to just keep going with this. I want to use this in the end to blend between my standard beauty pass in here and my distorted beauty pass. Let's first of all grab another blend node. Let's wire this after our distort node and in front of our null. And in this case, our distorted output should be the foreground, not the background. So let's write it in like this. Then I want to take my beauty pass in here from my file node, the C output, and I want to bring it over and wire this into the background of my blend. And finally, I want to go down to my CryptoMat mask and I want to go from my mask up into the mask input of this blend node right here. So the entire node tree now should look like this. And again, this should be all we need to do here. So let's again jump back out. 
Let's jump back to our switch node and again let's play our animation and let's also maybe reset the simulation on the solver and let's see what we get. Oh and beginner error in here. Of course the display flag inside our corpnet inside our solver doesn't matter so let's quickly jump back inside back to our corpnet and let's set a display flag add on null up here. And again after a bit of waiting we now have this really trippy kaleidoscope looking data mushing effect in here which I think looks a lot better than our default effect and a lot more interesting. And again, this is just scratching the surface of what you can do inside of this copnet inside of a solver node. You can add more noises, you can add more filters, you can just go wild in here and really build a lot of really different, really cool looking effects. The very last thing that I want to quickly do in here is I want to just quickly also build a setup to write those images back out to disk and for this, you guessed it, I'm going to use one last copnet in the setup. So I'm just going to drop down another null, call this out, drop down another cop network, wire this in or drop this below, and here again use a sub import, again use an external sub, again let's choose it out, again let's choose a geo to layer node, let's select RGBA, and let's finally drop down a rob image output. We can drag in the geometry to layer in here into the cop path. And then in here you have your typical output settings. And for outputting this say as a JPEG file, we're going to select our sRGB display and then also ASUS 1.0 SDR video like this. Or you can leave all those settings at default and write it out as an EXR if you want to do a lot more color grading later. But this is it for today and until next time it's cheers and goodbye. And also if you like what we're doing, please consider becoming a patron of ours. Not only for supporting Antagma, but also for access to in-depth courses. Like our new ML101 course, which teaches you all about machine learning. Or if you want something simpler, we have a newly revamped beginner series of Houdini with around 40 videos teaching you everything you need to know about getting started in Houdini. You can find this and a lot of other courses on our Patreon. And also let me say thank you so much to all our existing patrons. Without you, this channel would not be possible. Thank you.